Hello and thanks for joining us. Today as a special treat I'm delighted to be able to say I'm trying a wine from Maison Leroy, one of um, Burgundy's most noted producers. This is a, a Bourgogne Gamay and it's from the 2019 vintage. Um, so Maison Leroy, f um, famous for the fact that some of its top wines, mostly actually those from the Domaine Leroy, its, it's sort of sister um, enterprise, um, can uh, you know top tens of thousands of, of dollars uh, per bottle for some of the Grand Cru's, um, making them easily some of the most expensive wines on the planet. Um, this, um, as a Bourgogne Gamay, is not quite as expensive as that. I think um, the price on this is about 100, 100 US dollars a bottle. Um, but it isn't actually the, the, the bottom end of their range. They do make a, um, uh, a Beaujolais Primeur that comes in at sometimes half that price. So there is, there is some, some value for money to be had. Um, the, the story of Domaine Leroy, Maison Leroy, um, is is largely that of uh, Lalu Bise Leroy, one of Burgundy's really exceptional characters and somebody with immense determination. Um, Lalu uh, grew up in a situation where her um, great grandfather had started a negociant business in the late 19th century, um, and as a successful negociant, they had um, gained the distribution for the phenomenally um, reputed uh, Domaine de la Romani Conti. Um, and they control global distribution of that. Um, in the 1930s, as a result of that, when um, Domaine de la Romani Conti fell into financial difficulties as part of the depression, the, the um, worldwide depression of the 30s, um, her father had, had bought a share, a half share in the domain, um, along with the de Villain family, and so they, they had a joint ownership there. So Lalu grew up with, with her father as one of the directors in charge of marketing um, uh, Domaine de la Romani Conti, um, and she followed him into the business, becoming a director of, of DRC in 1974. Um, and she was responsible for, largely responsible for the, the international growth in, in Domaine de la Romani Conti's um, reputation worldwide. Um, by 1992, she and uh, her co-director, Ober de Villain, had had um, a number of falling outs and she, she left um, the domain. But she had other um, avenues to pursue. In 1980, her father had died and her, she'd taken control of um, Maison Leroy. Um, and in 1988, she'd bought um, a very good domain, Domaine Noelat, um, which had some fantastic uh, Grand Cru vineyard and other good Burgundy vineyard holdings, um, to which she added another uh, domain in um, Gevry Chambertin, and she, she renamed that as um, Domaine Leroy. Um, so she had the two businesses, Domaine Leroy for her own vineyards and Maison Leroy for the Negociant wines that she was she was making and distributing. And and her approach was to, to um, try and ensure that her wines were uh, the most sought after and the most um, expensive wines in, in, in Burgundy. She wanted to eclipse Domaine Romani Conti, which is something that um, the wines of uh, Domaine Leroy have, have largely done in terms of um, popularity and cost um, at the present stage. Um, the approaches she adopted were largely to, um, to follow biodynamic principles in the vineyard and the winery. Um, and at the same time, you know, keeping yields absolutely as low as possible um, and incredible degrees of selection of fruit you know, to make sure that the, the fruit coming into the winery was of the top quality. Um, in the winery, expenses weren't spared. I mean, um, uh, for the uh, uh, domain wines, 100% new oak aging is normal practice. So. Um, you know, the, there were there was no expense spared in making these wines. Um, this particular wine, you'll see, yes, the low yields. You'll see um, uh, wines that are um, hand harvested, hand sorted. None of this um, using um, an optical sort or anything like that, or conveyor belt even. The wines, uh, the sorry, the grapes stay as whole bunches, and they are reviewed by quite a large number of people to make sure that um, the quality is is all there. And the, you know, so the selection is all done by hand, by eye, 
Um, and um, so the production um, is uh, is done as a, a fermentation takes place with, with whole bunches. There's no distemming or going on there. Um, so you've got a semi-carbonic maceration. Um, the wines um, age in oak. Um, they ferment in large um, casks, um, in, in, in large open fermenters, um, and go go into oak for aging. Um, there is no fining. There is no filtration. Um, everything is fermented with ambient yeast. So, the very sort of classic quality production for for, for Burgundy, but everything taken to the furthest extreme of, of quality. Um, Bourgogne Gamay in itself is, is a relatively new Appalachian. Um, and although described as Gamay, you might think it might be an entirely Gamay wine. Actually, only 30% of the wine has to be Gamay. And that 30% has to come from one of, the, um, one of nine of the top 10 crews of Beaujolais. Um, but the other 70% could um, essentially be uh, Pinot Noir and you could have Pinot Noir from the Côte d'Or in there if you wanted to so it's not impossible that some of the um, domains um, declassified Pinot Noir makes its way into this wine I, I don't know they don't give those details um, so uh, yeah a really really interesting style of wine um, not uh, unlike the Pasteur Grant style but with um, a greater uh, emphasis on the, g the gamma. It has to be 30% past gram only has to have 15%. Um, so let's have a look at the wine, shall we? First of all, um, the colour. The colour is a, is a nice, um, darkly pigmented ruby red. Um, it's not particularly showing heavy tears in the, in the glass there, but um, what I would say about the colour, though, is it's actually it's not particularly deep. I can't I, I don't have any difficulty seeing through the, the, the wine as I look down. I can see the stem of the glass very clearly. Um, let's have a look at the aroma, shall we? The aromas are intense and they're ripe and they're developed. Um, the, uh, it, it's not just primary fruit. There's, there's a sort of an almost sort of licorice note to it, but the, the, the fruit there is, uh, it's, it's ripe cherries. It's where the cherry's gone from red to black style and is almost moving on to a sort of a, a leathery olive note. Or it's it's plum, where the, again, with plum going to black plum, black Doris plum. Um, that sort of intensity there. There's no um, obvious cedary note of oak. It's just sort of a rounded, ripe fruit. I mean, on the plum, plum almost a prune, in fact. Um, so th there is that sort of development note in there as well. Um, but yes, no obvious cedariness there. Um, maybe a hint of sweet spice at the very end there that might might point towards oak, but not not particularly. And that actually could equally come from the um, the stems in the in the, um, in the ferment, which would be good and ripe and could could add those sort of sort of details. So let's let's taste the wine. The fruit is rich, it's concentrated, but the tannins are smooth and not particularly gripping. There's a there's a velvetiness to their nature, and they, they do dry out a little on the back of the tongue there, but they're not uh, astringent in any way. They're not grainy. They're much more sort of um, chocolatey smooth. There's, there's a real ripeness to the fruit, and that's very evident at the beginning there. It's that sort of, as I say, black Doris plum that you're getting on the, the nose there. Licoricey hints, um, although licorice would sort of um, suggest a, a, a concentration. This isn't quite that that intense. Um, what else? There's a, a sort of a dark cherry, sort of, as I say, that black cherry, sort of red to black cherry, almost getting to slight overripeness. And, and there are sort of notes, not just of, of, of plum, but very ripe plum to prune. Um, the acidity is lively enough that the finish is quite fresh. Um, and again, at the finish, 
there's a, there's a sort of a slight warmth and roundness. The wine is only 12.5% alcohol. I'm surprised at that actually because its its ripeness sort of suggests that that might be higher. Um, so in fact, it's not alcohol at the end there giving roundness. It's it's probably the the structure, those lovely rounded fruit tannins, um, and the the finishes of, of mid length. And then what's left is that sort of slightly high toned, slightly spicy licorice, maybe almost a tiny touch of pepper there as well. Um, so yes, those flavours lasting quite nicely. With a little bit of age, the fruit will probably open out a little more on the finish and, and give it give it greater length. But that's a, a, a spectacular wine, actually. Its its structure is beautifully smooth. It's it I, I haven't really expressed how harmonious the entire nature of the wine is. Nothing particularly stands out. I mean it's got lovely freshness but the acidity doesn't stand out. It's got lovely tannins but they aren't, they, they're, they're harmoniously uh, melded with the fruit um, and the fruit carries on pretty much to, to, to the end. Um, yeah, super wine and you can quite see how um, at the higher echelons of, of the range these wines are in some of the most sought after wines in the world and hence command in, in incredible prices. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Do join us again. Goodbye now.